If there's one political party in this country that has potential to get a vote in each and every ward mm. across the country, it's only the ANC. True. The DA will never hit the 30% mark in South African elections. If he were my student, his term would fail without a supplementary exam. South Africans have experienced the most intensive power blackouts under this government of President Ramaphosa. Spread the fire. Welcome back to SMWX. And today I am extremely excited to welcome back a regular guest of this show, one of South Africa's most insightful and incisive thinkers when it comes to politics, what's happening. And today we are going to have a fascinating conversation about 2024. Where do the different parties stand? How do we assess President Ramaphosa's term in office? And more. So be very grateful be appreciative. Show love down in the comments below for none other than Mr. Lukona Nguni. Gokid. Dogode. When are we when are we calling you Dogode? Ah, this thing yeah, is yeah. taking very long. Oh, now. It's, uh, the country is burning. <laughs> we can't be doing PhDs. Oh, we can't be behind the yeah, thesis yeah. and keyboards. We can, <laughs> lest I become a keyboard warrior, my leader. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but we still need that doctorate. No, it's coming. You'll yeah. get it. You'll get Most it. Most guests on, on SMWX are doctors, so we're making an exception. No, no for pressure. You today. No pressure. Yeah, no we're pressure. making an exception. Today. You can give me an honorary one, leader. <laughs> I hear they are quite available. No, no, for sure. People in the comments will give you an honorary doctorate. They, they, they love our episode so much. Uh, Gokeli, let's let's kick off right at the heart of it. We have a massive election coming up in 2024. What's your reading of the political landscape right now? Sure. It's, um, I mean, I've been talking about uh, a political landscape that is characterized by nervousness, uh, where people are trying to really make all forms of calculations as to what it is that might happen in 2024. And I think the, the biggest one is the big elephant in the room of the 2024 elections is whether or not the ANC uh, will lose elections. And I think for the onlookers, that's uh, what is what keeps them occupied mm. and trying to think and we've had a long chat in one of the previous episodes Absolutely. about you know life beyond the ANC and mm. the need to begin to think about that mm. and if you live in a province like Gauteng all telltale signs are that the ANC will lose Gauteng though I was speaking with uh, <laughs> an ANC leader in his own right in the Gauteng province and mm. he said uh, he's willing to take a bet that uh, the ANC could still retain hmm. Gauteng. Uh, I, I, I'm not Gogo Obri Machigri, uh, <laughs> but uh, my political bones told me to take the bet <laughs> that yes, uh, uh, the ANC will lose Gauteng in 2024. I had a new word uh, which is uh, coming from student movements. It's, uh, are you sangomatic? Are you sangomatic? Yeah, what is the uh, underground gang telling yeah, you? <laughs> yeah. So have you been sangomatic? So I was sangomatic in that yeah. moment and I took the bet. Uh, yeah. We'll see after election date next nice. year but yeah what i think i, th I think it's a safe what, what i think what i think is you know you then think uh, what will life look like mm. um after the anc loses power in a in a province like Gauteng yeah. that has been characterized by a very unstable coalition governments mm. in two of the biggest metros mm. uh, the city of johannesburg and the mm. city of tswane and of course uh, some elements of it in the city of ekoruleni mm. mm. and hey, next thing al jama is also the premier toluguti the <laughs> hey all in one and know. you know upgrade guamanda <laughs> you know project upgrade guamanda could be 2024 <laughs> leader but i think um for the political players uh, the big question for them is what will it take mm. uh, to break the back of the ANC and it's yeah. dominant and it's you know really far you know reach into Absolutely. the South African society I often mm. say to people if there's one political party in this country that has potential to get a vote in each and every ward mm. across the country it's only the ANC True. True. that's very significant because it then tells you the scale of work mm. uh, once the anc primes its election machinery sure yeah. you might say people not, don't no longer like it mm. uh, but if, if it when once it primes if you take over the six hundred and fifty thousand odd members audited membership from the 2022 national conference and you said just a quarter of that needs to turn up 
do door to door, do sure. visibility campaigns. You're talking mm -hmm. about an army of 150,000 uh, people at least who are keen. Yeah. Now, some of the political parties don't even have uh, members who reach 150,000. Yeah. So 2024 is going to be interesting. No doubt a watershed moment. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the momentum of democracy. Every election should sort of become more significant than the previous election. Yeah. Uh, because it tells you that there's something in the momentum of your democracy that is happening. Um, it will also be characterized by new additions, whether or not mm -hmm. the barriers to entry for independent candidates will be lowered. We're still waiting on the a judgment from the Constitutional Court, yeah. which uh, case uh, as the Ravonia Circle, we were involved as friends of the court Absolutely. just to talk about, you know, the thresh signature thresholds, obscenely high. They are about shutting out competition and mm. preserving the represented the already inside and creating a far unequal playing field towards 2024. So yeah. looking forward whether the Constitutional Court will help to uh, level the playing field mm. Uh, mm. in 2024. So before we get to the excitement of what could be the outcomes of 2024, for. Yeah. Uh, we need to check whether the playing field uh, is as leveled out as it should be. And of course, I'm sure we're going to get into some of the emerging players who also want in, Absolutely. want a stake uh, in 2024. And, and the problem with a nervousness in the political landscape, mm -hmm. then it creates panic. And uh, of course, the problem with panic, as they would tell you during a fire drill in any building, mm. is that you need to keep calm so for that you make uh, well-calculated choices. Yeah. When there's panic, people make silly decisions. Mm. And those decisions have, unfortunately, in the context of elections, far-reaching implications for any country. Let's come to some of the polls, and, and I wonder how you respond to them. So what, we, <laughs> what we've done on this channel is... We've taken an average of the most recent three polls, so SRF, Ipsos, and the Brentost Foundation. And I wonder how you respond to the numbers. So when we averaged it out, the ANC was sitting at 43. The DA was at 25, but the SRS, F, SRF had put them at 31, which, which disproportionately affected that outcome. And then the EFF, on average, was at 15, which left 18% still up for grabs or undecided. How do you respond to, to that? Do you think that that's a, a decent assessment of where things stand at the moment? Well, I think uh, let's first talk about the polls that have recently come out, including the DA's own internal poll mm. that placed them at 32%. Yeah, and the ANC at 39 Now, that is impossible. Hmm. The DA will never hit the 30% mark in South African elections. Hmm. Impossible. Mm. Now, this is me being sangomatic again. Sangom sangomatic. What the DA might actually do yeah. in the lead up to 2024 is impugn the perceived credibility or the little that is left of polls, particularly hmm. election polls. Mm. And, now, and I think it, it's a message that we must amplify mm. that uh, people must not skew methodologies to such an extent that they create self-fulfilling outcomes. Of course, it's a funding thing. So if you go to funding, mm. uh, pot pot possible you know, funders, and you say, look, there's a chance I might be at 32% next year, but mm. I need your money to make it mm. happen. Mm. Funder is thinking, sure, that's a big shoot uh, from about 20% mm. um, to 32%. Clearly, you've turned the party around because in 2019, national and provincial elections, after the results came, you actually did an investigation. You actually got rid of yeah. uh, your party leader in Musi Maimane because mm. the party had lost just about 2% mm. uh, of the vote and you were blaming him for losing the vote, uh, particularly to the Freedom Front Plus. And if you, now you, that you've gotten rid of, hey, clearly you've done a massive turnaround and suddenly you are appealing. But in what universe, when the DA, since the departure of Musi Maimane, has lost Herman Mashaba, who has formed Action SA, has lost uh, Malin Duli, who mm. has now formed a, a, a organization groundwork collective which is motivating yeah. young people Shout to vote to um has 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 lost makashule ghana who has mm -hmm. co-founded uh, rise mzanzi has lost uh, the likes of pumzile fandam and so on um the the da has reached its ceiling with white voters the only way the da can grow is if it grows its base with black voters and colored voters in the main now it is losing ground in particularly in rural parts of the western cape in mm. terms of colored votes to the patriotic alliance it is losing ground with black votes because of even matching against questions around employment equity mm. in what world where you think you want a country that transforms that unburdens itself from the legacy of colonialism and mm. apartheid and you work against that actively and you campaign against that publicly sure. and you think you will still attract the black vote so 
and I'm raising these fundamentally to show the skewedness yeah. of the polls that are amplifying a growth of the DA. There are certain mm -hmm. ingredients that need to be in place for the DA to grow. Yeah. Now, um, a DA that is going to campaign in the Western Cape, for example, with three white men in the main, um, Alan Winder, uh, you know, Jordan Hill Lewis, and to an extent, J.P. Smith as the leader sure. um, uh, there in the city of Cape Town. With John uh, Stian Hazen. With John Stian Hazen the uh, at the helm. Uh, mm. you, 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 you don't have a formula that says to South Africans, we are inclusive, we are representative. In fact, you've mm. got a regression that simply says, we're taking it back to, I mean, uh, what Lindiwe Mazibuko in one Business Day article many years ago once called um, a, 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 a white male brains trust of the DA. Uh, that's really what the DA has become. So uh, if you think of what it would take for the DA to grow versus what the DA has been doing, mm. there's quite a mismatch there. And I think one of the last po points on this, somebody said they were actually called uh, mm. and asked if there were to be an election tomorrow. Uh, well, would they vote for the DA? And, and they say no. And, and then they say, uh, who would you vote for? And then they give a list of parties. But mm. that list of parties was not exhaustive. It was really of the main competitors. Therefore, the outcomes of that kind of study are going to be biased in terms of giving distorted outcomes. The best way to ask this question is, as you'd know, leader from a research methodology point of view, is to ask it as an open-ended question. Uh, if there was an election tomorrow, who would you vote for? Not give people right. limited and constrained training choices because therein is mm. built bias um, in, in the study itself. But let's track back a bit to the averages that you are talking yeah, about. Yeah. Uh, I think that, you know, the Brand Test Foundation study and parts of the Ipsos study mm. are much closer to reality uh, sure. than, than, sure. than possibly um, the, 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 the SRF study mm. and the DA's internal study mm. in the sense that, yes, the DA will probably hover around the 20% mark. Mm. The DA has a strength in what we call differential turnout, which sure. means it turns out its base. Its supporters, it achieves at least probably 70% voter turnout of those supporters of theirs, sure. which is where the ANC struggles. ANC supporters, when they're disappointed with the ANC, they tend to sit at home. Therefore, the turnout of the ANC supporters mm. becomes poorer, and therefore the performance at the polls becomes poorer. Look, when we did a study um, at the Ravonia Circle yes, last yeah, year yeah. Um, in August, September, which we published in November. Mm. Uh, we had partnered with Ipsos uh, mm -hmm. in that study. The ANC at that time, already a year ago, was at 42% yeah. in that study. Yeah. Um, the EFF had shown some growth, and I, I think uh, it's testament to uh, a, a, a growing, uh, you know, resonance of its message with certain bases of our population. We can talk about the limitations of their strategies sure, in terms sure. of some of the research that I've done later. Mm. Um, uh, the DA in our study had dropped just below 20% mm. at the time. And then, of course, Action SA was sitting at about uh, 5%. Yeah, if you four, look five, at that yeah. study now and look at the uh, either Brent has to Ipsos, yeah. Action SA has sort of dropped some support. Yeah. And you would probably note it's partly because of a number of reasons. After their policy conference, um, uh, Herman Mashaba himself has had to walk back certain policy positions. You'll never hear him and talk about the death penalty again. You'll have you'll never hear him and talking about, you know, deporting people. And some people were attracted by that loudness. But I mm -hmm. think what has hit home for Action SA is that uh, whilst those things might uh, you know play to that gallery that wants to hear, but it actually makes you move out of the center of inclusive politics and that South Africans in actual fact in, in their majority, they still do want to build a united society. They still do want to build a society that has as little discrimination as possible uh, along gender, sex, uh, religion, ethnic uh, background yeah. uh, kind of lines. And I think the more you do your research in trying to understand the pulse of South Africa's society, you actually realize that you profit little in the long-term picture uh, by amplifying divisive politics. And and I think that that's where things are. And of course, there is still a very strong block of people. Um, uh, it, it hovers between 12 to 18%. It depends on how you ask the question and, and, and what, the, what time of the year the study is. And those people are undecided yeah. uh, in terms of who they'll vote for. And uh, it's, a, it's a huge catchment of the voters' role. I mean, the voters' role this past weekend just grew uh, from 26.2 million to 26.8 million. So if you've got 15% of that uh, undecided, you're looking upwards of 3 million people. So let's, let's start 
looking at the ANC here, because I think one of the big headlines that comes from these polls, uh, actually, no matter which ones you look at, is that ANC is below 50. Is that your current reading of, of the ANC? Because there was some period earlier this year where it looked like, oh, hold on a second. They, they're starting to regain lost ground. It could be 48, 51. What's your reading of, of the ANC? Because if they fall below 45, as some of these polls are suggesting, that's, that's a historic game-changing moment in the history of this country. But if they get 49, well, you know, it's an important election, but it's, it's still more of the same in some ways. No, absolutely. It would be historic. Uh, it would actually be monumental uh, loss for the ANC because since 2009, um, the ANC has been shedding about 4 to 5% of its support from election to election. So from 2004 to 2009, coming back from, you know, uh, those mm. uh, heydays of two-thirds yeah, majority yeah, and so on, and 69 coming yeah. down. Uh, to 67 or so, coming down to 62 percent, mm -hmm. and then from two, uh, yeah, yeah, 2000, and, uh, yeah, 2009, they lose about three or four, mm -hmm. they come down to the 65 sort of area, yeah. come down to 62 percent, yeah, um, in 2014, come down to 57.5 percent mm -hmm. uh, in 2019. And if we say the NC can drop below 45%, yeah. that would mean uh, shedding over 13% of hmm. its support base. Now, yeah. the NC has always uh, managed a base of at least 10 million votes. Uh, so that would mean an ANC that's possibly at eight point something million votes and yeah. that that would be significant or still hold its 10 million base and other parties try differential turnout and sure. actually enthuse the electorate and achieve a higher voter turnout and and drown that 10 percent mm. is that possible uh, we can talk about where we think the psychographic nature of south african is in so far as electoral politics is concerned uh, at the moment but i think the biggest challenge for the anc is that they have not defined an election strategy this time around. And whether or not the decision to move somebody like Figuil Mbalula, who was for all intents and purposes uh, acknowledged as someone who can prime, mm. uh, you know, the election machinery of the ANC as head of elections to move him to the responsibility of secretary general, where the fundamental business there is not just to prime an election machinery, but it's actually to hold uh, the organizational structure sure. intact and together. And you've got far-reaching powers. And whether or not that power has not, you know, contaminated his ability uh, to, to help galvanize mm -hmm. the election machinery. And, and I think that's going to be a huge test. Uh, already you've seen some blunders um, over the past weekend, such as, you know, uh, them trying to amplify how the NC has been responsible for transformation uh, using the picture of the deputy chief justice uh, yeah. mandisa maya and the office of the chief justice really uh, coming out guns blazing mm -hmm. and, and rebuking that and they've had to apologize and and you know they an egg on their face mm -hmm. it's almost like they can't get anything right mm -hmm. um, in their machinery and whether you follow their leaders uh, president ramaphosa was here in Gauteng over the voter registration weekend uh Gwede Mantashe was in kwazulu natal paul mashatile was in limpopo um, you are not getting the kind of energy that you usually get an aura that mm. you usually get around uh, ANC leaders. And of course, if ANC is to lose uh, power significantly, it means that it's going to lose a majority in KwaZulu-Natal and in Gauteng yeah. province. Yeah. These are very, very important provinces in terms of that calculation. And we have seen the resurgence of the IFP support, it taking back certain, you know, ground from the ANC, particularly in the northern parts of uh, KwaZulu Natal. Um, and, 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 and the ANC's response to that, that, that doesn't seem to be clear to me, mm. uh, doesn't seem to be intact. Uh, and, and, and they don't seem to have a localized strategy that is to regalvanize its supporters. And I'll make a, an example. Uh, Besani uh, uh, was out somewhere uh, in in uh, the South Coast and speaking to an old chap there uh, in one of uh, the areas uh, closest to the areas of Pochepsi in Margate. And this old man says, no, we were the ones, you know, fighting uh, on behalf of the ANC, fighting against Ingata Freedom Party here in this area. And he says, mm -hmm. but uh, some of you don't even know me. And uh, he admitted that, no, uh, we, 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 I don't know you because I'm not from here. So mm -hmm. there's that mm -hmm. sense of 
whilst the ANC has local structures, there's no belief in the local structures to actually, you know, uh, inspire and enthuse and therefore uh, importing leaders into certain communities who can't really have intimate conversations yeah. with those communities uh, mean that they are running a campaign that is a fairly a, a, a cold door-to-door -door because there's mm -hmm. no connection and intimacy with the local issues, with the local people and so on. And it might be a clear example in terms of how leadership has eroded uh, locally in ANC structures uh, to the point of being trusted to run localized. So you have to press these national leaders and hope that some people know them. And unfortunately, not everybody knows those national leaders. And then, of course, I think there's still a funding issue, even though uh, uh, Dr. Gwen Ramachopa might say that, you know, the, the money is starting to come in. Um, the, the, the evidence is always in the detail. Uh, there was a point in time where Nobody could outpost at the ANC yeah. on any given uh, public, sure. uh, you know, uh, issue of national importance mm. like voter registration mm. day or voting mm. day. And we started seeing this problem in 2021 uh, when, you know, um, Action SA, for example, Ian Gauteng was the first to yeah. put up yeah, posters yeah. for local government elections. That. And the ANC's posters came literally almost two weeks before the election. You know, uh, I barely saw registration no, posters, actually, now that I think about it. Absolutely. The first posters came up, I think, around the Saturday mm. of the first weekend of November. The first yeah. posters of the ANC. That already some parties had already started putting up uh, posters mm. uh, a week or two before then. Sure. So you you find that um, the ANC is now more reliant on uh, the door to door. But what I also found interesting as I was driving around um, over the voter registration weekend was that. Actually, there are constituencies where the ANC has completely given up. Um, the more suburban, northern, sure. uh, you know, suburbs of mm. the city of Johannesburg, for mm. example, the ANC will post a few, just a sprinkle. Mm. But you go to a township like Kahiso, you'll find the ANC sure. postering sure. uh, quite strongly. Now, that is almost an admission mm. that the ANC is now one starting. Not, it doesn't have enough resources to spread them everywhere, so it must spread thinly mm. where it thinks it is dominant. Mm. Uh, but also it might be an ANC that is uh, saying, look, we've lost the fight in certain areas. Let's focus it uh, where we think we still have a fair chance yeah. and a good chance. But that begins in my mind to say it's almost self-admission that the ANC is no longer the leader of society that it professes to be. So are you working on the assumption that they will go below 45 I think at this moment, if there were to be an election tomorrow, I yeah. think the ANC would hold 50%. Um, wow. Okay. No, I think if there were to be an election tomorrow, yeah. I think the ANC would hold 50%. And that's simply because um, the, the, the political parties that can help take the ANC below 50% are not the established political parties. Yeah. Generally, what we are seeing is fatigue with all political parties. Sure, I'm sure, sure you get this. When you talk to people and ask them, uh, you know, uh, which politician, they say all politicians are the same. Mm. So the standard of a politician has been set by the ANC because of its vastness. Yeah. And what you need to convince people about is that I mean, I'm actually not like the ANC. Mm. Now, unlike the likes of the DA, they, they suffer the burden of having been around. The EFF suffers now, I mean, the burden of sure, uh, it sure. contesting the third mm. uh, national election. Election. And people yeah. have had time to observe it over the last 10 years since formation. It will be 10 years since it's been in parliament and ask themselves questions as to whether or not um, at, a, at, a, at a transformative political leadership, is this the party that mm. is an embodiment of that? Mm. So the parties that would potentially bring the ANC below 50% are new yeah. political projects. And unfortunately, I do not think at this point in time mm. Any new political project has done enough. Uh, it probably needs still a bit of more runway to have name recognition. Yeah. Then after out of that name recognition, gain brand equity. And then out of that brand equity, yeah. gain support and voters. And then out of that, be able to turn people out. Hmm. So that's why I'm saying if we were to have an election tomorrow, um, I think the NC would hold 50%. Hmm. Very interesting perspectives. And that's the difference between just snap polls in a moment and adding political analysis onto, onto that polling data and also questioning the methodology of the polling data. Let, let's come on. We've had a series of interesting conversations and I would encourage the listeners and the viewers to go back to our conversations because we've really been analyzing this last five years in South African politics quite deeply. 
Now we were uh, outcasts for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, because um, we both in our there's a cool aid we didn't drink. There's a cool aid we didn't drink, <laughs> and, and we've even called people out one by one who drank that Kool Aid yeah. um, of the New Dawn. No one even uses the word the term anymore. It's evaporated. Yeah, amazing, hey. Um, President Ramaphosa um, has been in office. Is it is it more than five years now? More than five years. In, he came in, in February 2018, 2018 yeah. on Valentine's. <laughs> <laughs> you even remember the, <laughs> and so that's a long time. You know, um, he's had a, a full term. How do you assess the term? Of course, I think it's fair now to say that we were right that it wasn't going to be this dramatic shift. But on the other hand, um, maybe the, the the slide of the ANC and the country hasn't been as fast as others predicted. How do you assess President Ramaphosa's term in office? If he were my student, his term would fail without a supplementary exam. <laughs> if he were my student. Luckily, he's not. Mm. He's the student of... ANC supporters and voters, mm. I'm sure they would be much more favorable to him. Mm. Why do you say that? Let's go back to the first major thing that President Ramaphosa does mm. after having been elected president of the ANC in Nazarek 2017. All those, all those years ago. Yeah, we've got to give perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... The week before he goes to Davos, to the World Economic Forum in January 2018, he's still deputy president. Mm. He had been, of course, assigned to head the ESCOM Warren by President Zuma in 2014. And... He then suddenly realizes now, because he's got the political power, so he clearly had been doing nothing mm. as head of the ESCOM <laughs> Warum for three and a half years almost. And now he has political power. The first thing he does sure. is to appoint a new board at ESCOM, mm. if you remember very Which well. Which everyone was celebrating decisive. Um, of course, everyone was celebrating it. And that's the first thing that some of us called out mm -hmm. uh, with the likes of Kantipai, mm. mm. um, Kaya Stola. I don't want to yeah. you know, talk Kaya, about the Dr. Stemble I mean, yeah. the, the people who didn't drink the Kool-Aid, Angelo Fick. I think they yeah. deserve a shout out. No, I no. think they deserve a shout out. When you're looking for political analysts, was, look at those who yeah. have got things right, especially when it's unpopular. To, Absolutely. To, to, to and, it, and it was unpopular at that oh, time. Um, you suddenly started getting less calls for mm. interviews because yeah. you were not speaking the language of the moment. Yeah. Why am I going back to that? Mm. As he appoints that board, uh, headed, I think, at the time by Jabo Mabuza, yeah, yeah. Um, he then does something intriguing and instructs the board to fire certain members of EXCO. And one of those members of EXCO mm -hmm. was Matsila Koko. So the board actions, Matsila Koko goes to the labor court and he wins. Yeah that this is unprocedural uh, dismissal because mm. the shareholder can't fire Exico. The board must be given space to mm. perform its duties and decide. Mansila Koko gets charged with corruption. NPA is investigating for a long time. Mm -hmm. Just not long ago, mm -hmm. Mansila Koko's case has been struck off the role of the Middleburg yeah. Magistrate Court. Yeah. That's the legacy. Adding to cases like Nulane. Nulane. So it's actually hard to see which big corruption victories that were promised have been scored in terms of not just investigations and commissions, but actual outcomes. I mean, the Guptas have not even had to come home to unfreeze some of their assets. They've done it all the way sitting in Dubai, just instructor tennis. Mm. There was a whole fanfare as to how the next National Director of Public Prosecutions Absolutely. was going to be appointed. Much celebration about the Much process. Much celebration about the process. Much celebration about the first speech mm. that Shamila Batohi mm. gave. And again, I said after she gave that speech, this is not how an NDPP speaks. You can't promise us to stay, stop state capture. Mm. You are a prosecutor. We want you to prosecute mm. the offenders. Mm. 
state capture will be stopped by politicians, not you. Sure. Right? And I'm using the state capture term loosely. Mm, mm. But she gave a huge speech, which was a political speech. Yeah. And, and for me, the wheels came off that moment. Mm. And I knew that not much was going to happen mm. in terms of prosecution. You don't put a, a political speech orator as a prosecutor. You put somebody who speaks the law and puts systems in place mm. to ensure that prosecution happens. This thing that we are seeing of cases being withdrawn, mm. cases being struck off the mm. wall, mm. no big fish uh, really being mm. caught, starts to make the naysayers question mm. Are these processes just used to abuse, to publicly persecute rather than prosecute? Absolutely. Look, 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 look objectively at what Machela Koko has, has been through. Obviously, yes. um, there's the state capture inquiry and, and various pieces of evidence were led there. But, I mean, how does the NPA not have the wherewithal to come to court with something? And, and these endless delays have actually been... Uh, adverse to his rights whatever, no of course i mean think. Wh when you arrest me the, the only time the hawks uh, uh, made a plea was when they arrested the former mayor of the city of etegu in mm, mm, mm. they said we are arresting her not because we have already gathered enough evidence against her but we actually want to remove her from the city so that she doesn't tamper with the evidence. Because so, so, so reason is given there yeah, and you yeah, sort of okay, can yeah. accept that. Sure. But when you arrest somebody mm. and pretend to be trial ready mm. when you are not, yeah. there's something wrong there. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure what it is and what we should call it, mm. but there's absolutely something wrong yeah. there because in the eyes of the public mm. and in the court of public opinion, because yeah. there is the court of law and there is the court of public opinion, yeah. You have already placed me squarely in the court of public opinion. But Absolutely. in the court of law, yeah. you are static. Mm. There's no movement. Mm. And yet it's only what happens in the court of law that yeah. could either acquit or convict mm. me mm. in the court of public opinion. Yeah, yeah. And if the court of public opinion has convicted me mm. and nothing happens in the court of law, I might never uh, reframe yeah. the Absolutely. court of public Opinion, and particularly if you are a senior person whose you know movements, mm. uh, whether career-wise, mm. whether business prospects-wise, is dependent on you being acquitted yeah. in the court of public opinion. Yeah. So there's something fundamental about our criminal justice system, the capacity of the NPA. I mean, you remember, I mean, Steinhoff donating to the NPA for Steinhoff to. <laughs> to be investigated by the NPA. So the point I'm making, yeah. they said President Ramaphosa would win the fight against corruption. Yeah, that was a key plank okay. of his promise. That, that, that's why I'm starting with this story mm. of Matsila mm. Koko, mm. because mm. it tells me that, mm. um, where are we now? Five years five, later, almost six years, years yeah. later, yeah. at least on that one score, because that was his first entry of attack. Yeah. I'm going to attack ESCOM. I'm going to remove this chaff mm. that is screwing over ESCOM and, you know, uh, eating. Yeah. I've, you, you can't be so bold mm. in that office. And your intelligence and everything else has not briefed you properly that you've got the right person or not. Mm. Or you've got the correct capacity within your state to then prosecute mm. these people. Mm. So that's the journey of failure. Yeah. We can then touch, I mean, a new dawn that promises a great sun, um, uh, which has left many South Africans in the dark. South Africans has, have experienced the most intensive power blackouts under this government of President Ramaphosa. It has been characterized and haunted by the darkness in practical terms of our streets, of our homes, of our neighborhoods, and dare I say, of the dreams of South Africans. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's funny to think how much hope there was in that moment. But you know, one of the interesting things I saw, uh, um, it was a presentation by the chief economist of ABSA, actually, at, at a conference I was at recently. And it showed business confidence versus effectively the financial sector's investment into the economy. And what happened when 
President Ramaphosa became president is that you saw business confidence returning to roughly um, not negative, but just neutral. But investment waited. And that was a moment where the economy had a chance to say, okay, we've restored some confidence, but we're now going to take the next step so that more investment can yes. rush back into the economy. And at that moment when investment was still being held, but confidence was relatively high, nothing happened and the investment stayed and confidence began to fall again. And that's, that's roughly where we are because we could talk about load shedding, but we can also talk about just baseline economic performance, growth, unemployment, inequality, private sector investment into the economy. All of those have largely stayed stagnant despite all these promises we've got of an economic turnaround. No, because uh, money doesn't follow promises. Money follows action. And there's been very little action. And I think, Cesar, to an extent, in actual fact, what happened in 2018 was not hope. I think people went into a self-induced therapy. Mm. To say, after former President Jacob Zuma, surely it can't get any worse. Mm. And therefore, whoo! Yeah. Let's have a moment of sigh and breathe and hallelujah. Mm. I said to you in one of our interactions, unfortunately, the business of accountability does not take a break. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And what happened in 2018? is that the business of accountability took a break. Very much so. Because sure, finally we were rid of mm. Umsholos. And here is this promise. And again, it's how we make reality out of our own imagination. Yeah. That a business person or a person who has money, because I'm also now beginning to doubt whether all people who have money are <laughs> business people. <laughs> and whether all business people have money. <laughs> Here's a person who has money. As Gwede Mandasha said, you know, mm. he wouldn't steal. Uh, pak pala pala for a while. Wow, we, we haven't even, let's not uh, even, yeah. But what Gwede Mandasha didn't tell us is that here is this one person who has money, but all these other thieves that existed under President Jacob Zuma will remain and they don't have money. Hmm. And what have they been doing in Northwest, building containers for millions of rands? Now in Mangaung, there's big trouble over tenders just to do an indigent register for the municipality. Why do you need to be paid more than 30 million rands? But where did they show us flames the most? At a time when the country and the world was at its most vulnerable during COVID-19, needing to spread the very little resources that were there to ensure that families have water, uh, poor people have food, and those who are on the front line have adequate personal protective equipment, PPE as it were. What did they do from the National Health Laboratory Service? They looted. They looted from food parcels meant for poor people. Counselors were not delivering food parcels. They were holding them for themselves. Others were reselling them. Now, in that environment, business confidence can't grow. In that environment, private sector can't invest. Leave this poof investment conference pledges that have been happening. Mm, I mean, mm. a company comes, it says it's making a, a pledge in the investment conference. When you go back to their annual report uh, two years ago, this is part of, uh, you know, the investment that they had already promised they mm, would make in any mm, case. Mm. All that they are doing is to read out their annual report yeah. from two years ago publicly in terms of uh, you know, uh, 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 capital mm. that they were going to set up anyway for reinvestment in the company. So you've got a problem, and it's a it's a it's a big problem because <clears throat> the other thing that President Ramaphosa 
um, has done is to build a parallel state. This is why you get business for South Africa saying, you no, know, they've made some gains. They now have three common areas of agreement to work with government, mm. to second people. Mm, mm. It's ESCO. And this is why uh, you will hear uh, my dear sister at Business Leadership South Africa, Busi Mavuso, mm. telling you which units are going to come back on, uh, you know, are mm. going to come back, mm. uh, if we were to say, commissioned online in Kusile, in Wewe. It's because they are inside Binekan. Mm. Mm. Uh, sometimes the business knows more than some people in government what's and, happening at ESCO. And you know that, that can be, some people in the short term might think, okay, well, at least we're stabilizing the situation. Who, who elected and who appointed business leaders to be so close to running the state and without what, any process. And, and, and the problem is when we say business leaders, we confuse society mm. because then society thinks there is a separation between business leaders and business owners. Sure, sure. The question we must ask is, mm. what does it do to fairness of business practice to the country mm. when a few business owners are so close to the state mm, mm. with a vested interest in those things they are helping the state with yeah, via their businesses. Mm. What of those business owners who have no foot inside sure. to the proximity of sure. the state? Sure. You distort the fairness mm. of the playing field, mm. of the economy, mm. of mm. the market, of, of doing business. Yeah. Then they say we've got Transnet. We must turn Transnet around. I'm being controversial uh, here, but what's the definition of capture in my big, because if business is literally running government in certain places, yes, we've created a certain brand of state capture that was a certain form, of, but capture is when the private sphere outside of public engagement is able to harness government decision-making for its own ends. This leader, what we are living under, and I'm trying to define, is the real essence of capture. In fact, it's almost a coup yeah, my on the state, just that it is a silent coup. Sure. Because business has gotten to a point where on certain fundamentals, I mean, look at mm. the ESCOM thing. Mm. Uh, Dr. Sputla Ramachopa, Jose Enzo Ramachopa, mm. <laughs> uh, announces a fund, 100 million rands is going to be mobilized by business to help ESCOM come to. You think you're just going to spend it anyhow you like? No, it's not going to happen. So that means business has a constant interest. Now then when you see rapid movement of the, you know, uh, what do we call it? Um, I don't want to say de-entanglement. It's not the right word. The right word escapes me now. But mm. when you unbundle, yes, mm, ESCO, mm, mm, mm. generation, distribution, transmission. Yeah. Business is not interested in generation. That's where your biggest debt at ESCO is. So leave that to the government. Mm. But this one of transmission and distribution, let's create competition. Yeah, yeah. But now they are self-defining the rules. So now you have a problem where business. So when Transnet says the Deben line uh, to the Val or the train line mm. or the whatever. Mm. Uh, we want it to be taken out to private players. Yeah. Who, who are going to be these private players? Mm. How distant are they from these business owners mm. and leaders who are already yeah. in the transnet world? Mm. 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 Uh, then they say they want to fight organized crime. The only difficulty they have with the third point of fighting organized crime is that uh, it will be too obvious when they capture the NPA or elements. Those have really been said. They must completely be independent. Mm, mm. And of course, if they did anything there that's untoward, civil society will be on top of them mm. and uh, litigating. These other ones are loose arrangements. They are much more difficult to, mm. to really pin to a point of trying to remove business out of it. So now, what that does, it encourages further the erosion of state capacity. Because, no, we've yeah, got this baby. Absolutely. We've absolutely. got this babysitter. 
mm. that is now called business. Sure. So people were already always worried about the nanny state. Now we've got a different problem, mm. uh, where the state is the baby mm. and not the nanny. So instead of uh, state intervention into the economy, we've got business intervention into, into the, the state. Into the state and not even into the economy. Mm. They're saying for the economy to thrive, let's first intervene here. Now, leader, ports, power stations, all of these things are national key points. They are governed by a particular unique legislation that has to deal with questions around intelligence, national security, and all of that. There's a reason business is called the private sector and not the public sector. Once the private becomes the public and the public becomes non-existent, mm, mm. you are in a world of anarcho-capitalism in political science terms. Yeah, anarcho-capitalism. Because clearly government must run nothing. Mm. Mm. And the private must run everything. Mm. And just use government as this like shell that appears to be public. Yes. And then what of the regulatory ability mm. Mm. of government? There is none. Last point. President Ramaphosa says, I need somebody to cut red tape. He appoints a very lovely gentleman, Babu Sipongos. Can't fault him for nothing. Mm, mm. In his days in the mining sector, sure, sure. he led one of the best BE schemes that were about employ mm. uh, empowering the employees mm. right down to the lowest paid worker mm. in Exaro. Can't fault him. But yeah, how can you cut red tape when you are not in the system? What's red tape? You are simply saying as the president, in my government bureaucracy, there are things that frustrate the ability of businesses to thrive. But do you know what? These things are in law, in humans, and in, in inefficiency. That is within the state. Then you say, come, Sipongosi, out of retirement, mm. cut red tape. Mm. You are passing the buck. Sipongosi can't cut red tape in government. He's not in the system. Mm. If you're not a DG, there are certain things you can't do. If you're saying you want to cut red tape, DG must write a particular circular to a particular department. And if DG says, I don't know who you are, you're not even the minister, mm. I want to write that circular, you're not going to cut red tape. Mm. So the, pres the president, not only is he passing the buck, outsourcing, he's dismally failing at leading the transformation of the state. And that's, 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 that's really where we are. So, so Lida, um, there's been this IEC registration weekend as we go up to the election. And here on this channel, just like in 2019, we want to make it a hub for all things elections. Um, what's your reading of how that registration weekend went and what it means about the voters, the voters' role? Well, it was an interesting um, uh, voter registration weekend. Um, I think more political parties could have come out, you know, more to galvanize society towards, uh, you know, registering to vote. Uh, the IEC could have had its machinery a lot more organized and, and, you know, as well, as you would have seen, their posters came up like, in the week of sure. voter registration, mm. they started flooding the streets with their posters. Yeah. And now I see billboards uh, that are... Billboards that are coming up that were not there before yeah. the voter registration weekend. Now they're yeah. there. Of billboards that were... <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, I think we need to talk to our leadership the, at the IEC just yeah. to plan better. Sure. Um, just give SMWX, you know, an ability but, but, to talk to young people about the election. And, and, and give you the platform. Just, Come to your platform. And, you know? and I think, you know, they've, they, they say they've been trying to be innovative... They've launched a WhatsApp bot and so on, but I still think uh, not enough in terms of connecting the, the, the conversation with young people. Sure. And I think part of the problem is that in the South African context, we are still framed around voter education. Mm, mm. Because education, my leader, as you would know, means that you have certain knowledge deficiencies that can only be sharpened mm. through education. You have certain empty vessels that can only be filled. Sure 
through education. And it's not that hard to figure out. Like, I vote in order yeah. to do something. Most no. people understand that. Now, people understand what voting yeah. means. Yeah. So this is why where I work, we've framed it as voter conversations, mm. not education. Because mm. education means I've got the answer. You need to listen. Yeah. And if you don't listen to what I tell you, I examine you and you failed. If you don't go vote, you mm. failed. Mm. Whereas conversation is about beginning a negotiation exercise with society to mm. say, sure, I get why you might not be voting. These are the things that you are despondent about. Mm. But let's cross-check those against what your non-involvement in the process could actually mean. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore, what could the, be the benefits mm. of your involvement? That's the kind of thing we should be doing. However, it takes more time, leader. It's like development. It's like the real development leader. Mm. It's undesirable because it takes time. Mm. Uh, people want to do quick fix projects. Yeah. And this is why we don't achieve sustainability of our interventions because we don't have the patience. Voter education, as they call it, cannot start in the year of the election. Mm. It's a continuous, continuous, continuous process to engage society Absolutely. on their views and why they are losing trust in politicians. Yeah. So if research tells us that trust in politicians in South Africa is below 40%, why do you think people will be enthused to go and vote for people they don't trust? Mm. We enter into relationships with people we trust. And that's why when trust erodes, the relationships break down in the workplace, sure. in family, anywhere. Where there is no trust, relationships break down. Yeah, yeah. That's very important. The question is, how do we rebuild trust? Mm. And our political leaders also have a responsibility here. But also voters, that's why we need to enter into a conversation. Mm. We need to say there's a spectrum. Which politicians do you trust the least? Sure. Which politicians do you fairly trust, mm. even if you don't trust them the most? Mm. And then make choices out of that. Mm. Now, people say it's choosing, uh, you know, the, 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 the bed amongst the worst. Mm. Uh, well, leader, if you're a farmer and you've got a terrible harvest of maize meal, and uh, where I come from, Ngabe Mampondo in a city, Umlungu, a uh, spoiled maize mill. Umlungu, mm. uh, you can't even uh, get a few uh, corns for the chickens. You just take it to the pigs. Mm. It goes there immediately. Then as you look, there's the better one. Mm. Half, uh, you know, your, your, your maize meal is kwebu. Uh, you know, I must lose my line. I just guess and sazzle it. It's kwebu sombona. Half of this maize meal thing from the from the garden is rotten. Half of it is not. Sure. Like Kuba leader, mm -hmm. uh, the one that's not rotten, you feed your chickens. Mm. And then the good one, you leave for yourself. You eat. Now, that's where we are in South African politics. Mm -hmm. that must just be sifted out and given to the pigs. Mm. There's the kind of stuff we can work with. We might not have the most refined of the maize sure. and we must make those choices. Mm. Mm. You can only do that through a conversation, not through education, because mm. your educating mm. is fundamentally on a wrong basis that at all given times, you should vote. No, try to understand why people are not voting. Mm -hmm. So the current, the, the past re voter registration weekend quickly leader mm -hmm. um, has added uh, about 568,000 people yeah. into the voters roll. And um, quite a high number of those people are people from the ages of 30 upwards. Um, if you look at the voters roll today, we still have a massive under enrollment of the cohort of young people between mm. the ages of 18 and 19. Mm. There's over 2 million of them and only 400 and some change thousand of them are registered, mm. which means there's a 25% or so uh, there, uh, uh, just over 25% registration rate. Um, we are still below 50% of the cohort between 20 and 29 in terms of registration mm. uh, rates. So in fact, I was doing this exercise last night there are just over 13 million people who are eligible to vote mm. but are not registered. Of those people, 10, about 10 million of them are people who are 39 years and younger. Mm. And of those people, 6.6 .6 million of them are people who are 29 years and younger. Mm. 
It's a very significant thing mm. because what it tells you is that there is a lot of work to be done with younger people to register. Yeah. But it's also beginning to show us, leader, if you were to look at the participation uh, rates across provinces, um, of the 2.9 million people, majority of those people uh, were people who were just going to check their registration status. They are already registered. Mm, mm. And some and and a lot more of them were checking their registration status in the same VD where they are registered. Mm. You had high participation in Gauteng, well, fairly high in Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal, but very disappointing participation rates in a province like the Western Cape, mm. which is interesting mm. because, uh, as I might shock you, is that the Western Cape is my blind spot province going into 2024 mm. elections. It's the province that we don't want to talk about, mm. but it's the province that's also vulnerable to a coalition government. Mm. 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 So the voter registration weekend tells us that not too many people are enthusiastic about becoming first-time voters. Mm. The second part is that it's telling us that uh, achieving high voter turnout is going to be extremely difficult. Mm. Mm. And thirdly, I think the lesson there is all of us in society must be hands on deck mm. to try our level best to convince at least those who are already registered to come out to register to vote mm. because... As you can hear, there's a lot of noise. Yeah. We've always said it's a noisy democracy. Mm, mm. But man, the decibels keep going higher and higher. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's actually one more question that comes to mind, which is also the uncertainty of the election date and the power that the president has to determine that date. I'm actually starting to get just tired of like not knowing when the election's going to be. And I think that also may play into, you know, people registering for what, for when. Um, we don't even know when the election's going to be, and it could be in six months. Whereas in other democracies, okay, in some democracies, they, they never know exactly when the election will be. In other democracies, there's a set date. Um, let alone the rationality of the process of how that date, uh, date gets determined. Do you think we should change that? Because there's no reason why we should live in this world where like six months before an election, you don't know the date. And then, and of course, there's a political incentive for the incumbent to set the date at the time when it, it best suits uh, them. So we haven't had that conversation about the limbo we're always in before elections around the date. No, but uh, it, you know why you, this limbo is so pronounced mm. this time around mm. is because 2024 has been the most anticipated election after 1994. Mm. We started talking about this election two years ago. Yeah, yeah. This is why we find this limbo mm. unhelpful. We didn't complain in 2019. Sure. We didn't complain in 2014. Mm. Don't remember in 2009 as complaint. Mm. This complaint is being raised by the fact that we have been so impatient for this election to come because we see it as almost a breakthrough election. Mm as an election where society is now finally ready to make a statement to the ANC that if you misgovern us so badly, if you mistreat us so badly, and if you take away from us so much of opportunity and our future, we actually have the ability to show you at the polls. And I think we are entering that moment in a comrades marathon where the athlete is thinking of uh, quitting uh, when they are going up Drummond and then they go down uh, you know, Sherwood, uh, and they're still thinking of quitting, and then they are into Berea, and you, you know exactly that the stadium and the finish line is not that far, but you still quit. Sure, sure. I think we we create, we, we, it's a self-created crisis in a way. We, we spoke about this election way too far before it came. We anticipated way too much, mm -hmm. and I think some people are beginning to still be disappointed about the level of quality of the choices on the ballot mm -hmm. or potentially on the ballot. But the, the, there's a, a much more fundamental seriousness as to um, uh, uh, why this election date becomes difficult for the president. Mm. The Constitutional Court has not ruled sure. uh, uh, on the case before it, which may fundamentally affect the way in which the timetable of the IEC should look like mm. and the way in which the ballot papers should look like. And um, the 
is still the matter of the electoral um, amendment matters bill, mm -hmm. electoral matters amendment bill, which because the party political funding act, for example, says nothing about independent candidates, uh, parts of the electoral act need to change, parts of the electoral commission act needs to change, and and and. So that bill hopefully will be served before the portfolio committee on home affairs by month end or at least beginning of December mm. before recess of parliament uh, because that bill has to be passed. It, it influences a number of things, the opening of voting stations, how voting is done. The IEC puts some proposals to politicians and see whether they'll get that or not. So there are fundamental structural issues. Sure. But I think the president also has to make a political calculation mm. with his comrades. Mm. The Party Political Funding Act, what it now does, is it says Chancellor House can no longer give whatever much it can give to the ANC. It can only give 15 million rands per year. Mm. That year runs from the 1st of April to the 31st of March. And you may want to then say, well, on the 1st of April, Chancellor House in the new year can uh, give more money to the ANC. And therefore, I need more time to campaign mm. to use that money mm. to be in the minds of society. Mm. What I do know, though, is that the IC is quite clear. They don't prefer a winter election. So the yeah. elections can be either in May yeah. up until August, yeah. uh, the 90-day period, mid-August. Um, the IC doesn't prefer a winter election because it tends to give a poor voter mm -hmm. turnout mm -hmm. as per August 2016 local yeah. government yeah. elections. So... But the ANC may be looking at the statistics and reading the, 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 the terrain mm. and realizing that from the by-elections, what is emerging is there's poor voter turnout, it favors the ANC. Mm. So it's, it's, it's a big calculus. It's not even that the president himself has the power, but there will be also other political considerations. Sure. Unfo unfortunately, it's a political space. Yeah. There's nothing that we, there's nothing much that we can do. Should there be a set date, uh, our constitution itself, in fact, puts mm. us at limbo because it says at the fifth anniversary of the previous election, yeah or no later than 90 days yeah. after that fifth anniversary. Kokeli, let me uh, let me release you to your your world of uh, obtaining a PhD, uh, political commentary and activism. Writing and, a book uh, apparently. <laughs> yes, yeah, we need that book as well. So uh, and thank build, you. And building democracy in our society. Indeed, but thank you so much for being such a regular guest on SMWX and for joining us one, one more time. It's always and a pleasure. Uh, it's a good way for me to end what has been a dramatic year. Indeed, and we started the year, I think. Almost. With, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and I'm sure you'll be back before the 2024 and after no to doubt. help us analyze what happened. <laughs> no doubt. Are we seeing you in Parliament? What's going on? Are you going to Parliament? Definitely not in 2024. <laughs> okay. Definitely not in 2024. So you say. We'll Someday. see. <laughs> Aye, aye.